Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Here we are, another day, another new podcast episode. Let's keep calm and carry on, shall we? So, this is episode number 761, and most of this one was recorded live at the British Council in Paris in front of an audience of people. I think this is the first podcast I've ever recorded with a live audience there. And it sounds a bit different because you can hear the audience reacting to things I'm saying. And there are some moments of interaction with the crowd and some jokes and stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. As you may know, I teach English to classes of adults at the British Council in Paris. But also, we have some extra events there in the evening. The talk that you can hear me doing in this episode was one of those extra events. And I'm hoping to do more of this kind of thing in the future, podcasting in front of a live audience. Uh, just before we start properly, I want to tell you something about taking English lessons with the British Council, which is something that you can do online. Did you realise that? Are you interested in having private English lessons online with a British Council teacher? Because you can. Um, sometimes people ask me, if I'm available for private lessons? And unfortunately, my answer to that question is usually no, uh, because I've just decided that I spend my time making episodes of my podcast and teaching group classes in the real world, so to speak, sort of in a classroom. So if you wanted lessons with me, you would need to be in Paris which is where I live, of course, and you'd need to become a student at the British Council there or here uh, using the normal registration process and then just hope that you end up in one of my classes. So really, if you know, if you wanted to be one of my students, you'd actually have to come to the school where I work and sign up and hope to get me as a teacher. But other British Council teachers are available, of course, Plenty of other BC teachers are available and they are online. So if you are looking for an English teacher for private lessons, I just want to let you know that the British Council does offer this service now. Personalised one-to-one -one lessons with a British Council teacher online. And this is great because you can do it anywhere in the world. You can choose the date and the time for lessons. It's totally flexible. You can choose the teacher. You know, you can check out all their teachers and sort of shop around and choose the teacher that uh, you'd like to uh, have as your teacher. I mean, I say the teacher you'd like to have. You don't get to have that. You don't get to keep them. I mean, it's not like eBay. It's not Amazon. You know, hmm, I want that one, please. I've got a spare room at home. No, you don't actually get to have them. I think you know what I mean. So anyway, you can choose the teacher and you can basically have classes which are designed around your needs completely. I mean, again, I say your needs. I mean, you know, your your English needs, of course. As I said, you don't actually, you can't actually have the teachers. Um, but yeah, the classes are designed around your specific uh, English requirements. Uh, and, you know, you can have them whenever and wherever you want, basically. So, you know, if you want to practice your speaking and have your errors corrected, for example, you can. If you want to work on your grammar and vocabulary, you can. If you want to develop your pronunciation to be a clearer speaker or to work on a more British sounding accent, if you like, then you can do that, too. Also, you can have lessons for specific purposes, such as for exams, for job interviews, for specific work arrangements, uh, for, you know, for your, your work-based English, professional business English stuff, uh, if you want to prepare for the IELTS test. It's all possible with these private online lessons because they're all based around what you want to do, and the British Council teachers will design the lessons based on your priorities. And... Um, I've always said that listening to my podcast, or in fact any podcast for that matter, is an important part of your learning process. It's the five L's, listening, 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 and listening. But of course, you need to be doing plenty of speaking too, and to practice all the other things, you know, all the other language systems and skills. And one-to-one -one lessons are a really great way to achieve that, and doing them online with an actual human teacher face-to-face, -face, is now a completely normal, tried-and-tested way to do this. All you need is just the right service. 
And the British Council does offer that service. It's called British Council English Score Tutors. It's the official one-to-one tutoring service from the British Council. It's quite new, but they already have 12,500 learners of English using the platform. Uh, There are currently over 150 teachers there. Uh, The tutors or teachers on English score have an average rating of 4.9 stars out of 5, which is quite reassuring. You know, it means that people uh, rate the, the lessons that they're getting. The teachers are all British Council approved, and uh, a lot of them are in the UK. Uh, But there are also British Council teachers living in other countries all over the world. You know, I mean, I live in France, but you've got British Council teachers living in all, all manner of places around the world. So you can find teachers in most time zones, which means basically that there are teachers available 24 hours a day, you know, 24-7, round the clock. So you'll be able to find someone to match your timetable, I expect. So why not go ahead and find a teacher for you and book some lessons to really push your English further and gain more confidence? Uh, And, yes, there is an offer for you. There's a sort of a discount offer, special, special thing for you because you listen to this podcast, by the way. I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Maybe you listen to me regularly, right, and you're happy that you can understand me or that you've got to the stage where you're understanding most of what I say, which is a very good sign, by the way, if that is the case, if you find that you're able to understand pretty much, you know, like pretty much everything I say, that's great. So that's really, really important part of the process of like acquiring a, another language is being able to understand it. Uh, but obviously, there's the whole productive side of things as well. So if you've got your sort of, um, what do you call it? If you've got the receptive side um, to be pretty good, if you've developed your listening to this standard, then why not build on that and get your speaking up to a similar standard? And if you're working on your listening and you're making progress, there's a good chance that you can convert that to speaking and you can make progress there as well. So, you know, just activate your English is the idea. Work on your fluency and accuracy and clarity and general confidence, which, of course, are vital things. Again, it's the five S's, speaking, 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 speaking and speaking. Um, and, you know, one to one private lessons are a great way to uh, to do that. And you might be asking at this point, Luke, what about that special offer, Luke, that you mentioned? So, yes, the British Council is offering you a first introductory session for just one dollar. So, you, you know, that's so you can see if you like it. Basically, you can have one lesson, your first lesson for just a dollar. And that's no strings attached. You can just try it out for one dollar. See if you like it. Um, and there's no pressure or obligation to continue after that. You know, you don't have to buy one for a dollar and all the rest for the normal price. You can just get one for a dollar and see if you like it. If you if you like it, you can then go ahead and actually buy a packet. Uh, you know, buy a pack of lessons. If you if you're not so keen, you can be like, ah, oh, no, not this time. So it's uh, totally up to you. Um, but if you choose to buy a pack of lessons, which is normally something like twenty hours maybe 10 two-hour lessons or 20 one-hour lessons or something like that. If you do choose to buy a pack of lessons after your $1 introductory session, then the British Council will throw in a free lesson for you because you're a Lepster, which is nice. So basically, the first lesson is just $1. And if you like it, you can buy a pack of lessons with a teacher and get a free lesson included because you're a Lepster, which sounds pretty good, right? Um, and you know, this is, I work for the British council, so I'm, you know, quite glad to tell you about this service. It's kind of a win-win. So this could be your, your way to really work on your speaking as well as your listening. So think about it. It could be a really good move. Also young learners, you know, if you've got teenage kids, uh, they, the, the British council, uh, English score tutors, they do young learners too. There are, Uh, lessons available for 13 to 17 year olds and you get the same deal you know one dollar introductory lesson and then the free lesson afterwards uh, if you buy some lessons so to find out more about this and to get that special offer of the free lesson go to teacherluke.co.uk 
right? Teacherluke.co.uk slash English, right? Teacherluke.co.uk slash English, or just click the private lessons button on my website menu. Also, the link is in the description of this episode. And, you know, just to, just just so you know, you'll only get that free lesson if you enter the website through my link. OK. All right. Nice one. So, you know, obviously do that. <laughs> OK. Um, teacherluke.co.uk slash English. All right, then let's begin the episode properly then. And here is the jingle. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. So, hello, listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. As I said before, let's get back to some normal podcasting, shall we? I think that would be a good idea. Okay, then, let's do it. So, uh, this is episode number 761, and it's called Why We Love the Beatles recorded live at the British Council. And as you can tell from the title, this episode was recorded live at the British Council in front of an actual audience of human people, as I mentioned earlier. So I I will play the recording to you in a few minutes. First, I just want to tell you about the talk I did and how I prepared for it in order to perhaps share some personal tips I have about public speaking. Now, This might seem like another one of my epically long introductions, but it's not, okay? If you're thinking, Luke, is this another 15-minute introduction? No, it's not, okay? It's not. Because, in fact, let's imagine, in fact, let's just say that the introduction is over now. And here we are in the main body of the episode, all right? The introduction done. Ah, what a relief it it is to know that the introduction is, is behind us now. So if you do get that sneaking suspicion of like, oh, this introduction's going on a bit. No, it's not, because now we're in the middle. We're actually in the meat of the episode now. So you don't have to worry about it, do you? Um, So here we are in the main body of the episode. And what I'm doing now is I'm giving you some comments and advice about how to speak to an audience of people. Public speaking. Because public speaking is a slightly different skill to just normal speaking. And certainly from my point of view, it's a different skill to normal podcast recording where I'm sitting on my own. Um, So it might be interesting for you to hear me doing it in this episode. Uh, And so here's some context and also some tips and just some thoughts about public speaking. So the British Council in Paris, where I work part time, is essentially a language school in a nice building not far from the Eiffel Tower. We teach classes to adults and children and also there's an exam centre for the IELTS test. The BC in Paris also offers some special evening events, including regular talks in English. And talks in English, this is This is when a guest is invited to come and talk about a specific topic at the school in one of our nice big rooms on the second floor. And everyone is invited to attend. And that means students at the school, but also anyone else too. Friends, staff at the school, other teachers, just anyone who's interested in attending. Someone just walking down the street, just a a casual passerby. Uh, who walks down the street. Oh, interesting. They're doing a talk about the Beatles. I think I'll attend. They can just, you know, they can just sign their name and go in and and watch the talk. And the speaker does their talk. And afterwards, there's a chance to socialise, drink some wine and talk in English together. You don't have to drink the wine, but it is there. You know, free wine. I mean, you know, people, sometimes I wonder, maybe these people come just for the wine. I don't know. But um, it's nice. It's a really nice thing. And our marketing manager, Phil, is always on the lookout for people to do one of these talks in English. He's always looking for speakers. And a couple of months ago, he asked teachers, you know, he, he often asks the teachers, oh, if anyone wants to do a talk, just let me know. He asked me if I'd like to do a talk about anything. And I immediately thought of the Beatles because it's one of my favorite topics And it's a very British topic. It's relevant to British culture. And it's the sort of thing that would probably attract some people to the school, you know, to visit for the talk. Uh, And also the TV series produced by Peter Jackson called Get Back. Uh, Beatle fans or casual Beatle fans will probably know about that. 
that there was a, a new uh, TV series called Get Back um, released on Disney Plus at the end of last year. That had just been released at the time that Phil asked me about this. So, um, you know, that was fresh in my mind. And so basically Phil and I agreed that we would do this and we put it in the diary. So I decided that the title of my talk would be Why We Love the Beatles. Right, that's what I chose. Why We Love the Beatles. And basically I wanted to try and explain why the Beatles were and still are so popular. What is the appeal of this group? Why are they so adored by people even 60 years after they first came onto the scene? That's basically what I wanted to focus on. I also decided that I would try and record it as an episode of this podcast, which, you know, you're going to be able to hear. Now, I know this is another episode about the Beatles, and some of you might not be that interested or keen if they are not your cup of tea. You might be thinking, I prefer Led Zeppelin, or I prefer, I just prefer silence, Luke. You might be thinking, I don't know, I don't I, you know, I don't know your, your musical tastes. But um, yeah, my talk is called Why We Love the Beatles, but some of you probably don't love the Beatles that much, or maybe you just don't know. And that's totally fine, of course. I get it. I'm not here to convince you that they're the best band or anything. Music is subjective. It's a question of personal taste. But I still hope you listen to this because I might be able to help you understand why people love them. I'm now going to give some tips and comments about public speaking and how I prepared for my presentation. But if you would rather just skip straight to the recording of my Beatles talk, if you're not interested in the stuff about public speaking and my advice or comments about talking to an audience, if you'd rather skip straight to the Beatles bit, then you can move forward to 30 minutes. That's the 30 minute mark in order to skip straight to my presentation. Okay, so if you want to do that 30 minute mark, that's where the presentation actually begins. Let's talk about public speaking then and doing a presentation in front of a uh, an audience. All right, so I just want to mention a couple of things about how I prepared to do this talk. Maybe this can help you learn a little bit about public speaking or at least just consider it. Um, I don't know if you ever have to do presentations. If you will ever have to do presentations, it, as I said, it's a, it's a specific, it's a particular set of skills. Let's think about it. So I had to prepare to talk to a room full of people for about 45 minutes. And it was, it was a fairly small audience, to be fair, about 50 people. Is that a small number or a big number? for an audience. I don't know, really. I will let you decide. Uh, But imagine you had to do that. Uh, Talk for 45 minutes in front of about 50 people. So imagine that you have to do it. So or imagine you had to do that. What would you be thinking then in the sort of days or weeks leading up to that? What would you be thinking? How would you do it? Um, How would you prepare? What are the important things to consider? Now, obviously, there are many factors involved, like, you know, simply the subject matter or the reason that you're doing it. I mean, this particular talk was less pressured because it was essentially a a nice event, you know, a, a friendly social event and a chance for me to talk about a subject I love. If it was something like presenting the financial records to um, the board of directors in some horrible company, that might have been more stressful. Or if I had to persuade the room, if, if it was a, an unfriendly room or whatever, you know, it depends on the context. But what are some of the important things to consider when you are standing up in front of a room full of people to hold their attention for even an, an hour I knew the audience would be a mix of adult learners of English, mostly French people and maybe some other nationalities, with an English level at intermediate and above, and also some native English speakers. So I sort of, you know, I had a basic profile of the audience. Obviously, you've got to know who you're talking to and what they expect, and you've got to know what the main purpose is. Uh, So I knew who I was talking to. I knew my purpose, which was to try and talk about the Beatles in an entertaining way. I didn't want to write a script. This is often what people do. They will just start writing. They'll write the script. And then the presentation is there in written form. But I didn't want to write a script because I wanted to keep the presentation spontaneous. 
uh, a presentation like this, it's not just words. It's how you deliver those words. Okay, it's how you make a connection to the people you're talking to. It's not just the words. So I find that if I write a script, then I just get stressed during the talk because I'm trying to remember everything I've written. And that is impossible. And reading from a script can take the life out of a presentation. It can take away a certain spark, especially if the person is actually reading from the script on paper and they have to kind of keep glancing up like that to look at the room every now and then but not really connecting with anybody you know you've seen people do that time and time again so it it depends of course you know this whole question of having a script or not it depends sometimes you need a script because in some cases every single word is vital and you might have a prompter or something that's a kind of a screen which shows you your script without the audience seeing it like in those big political speeches or maybe if you're doing a best man's speech at a wedding or if you're doing a um, like a bridesmaid's speech at a wedding it can help to have the script in your hand it depends on the situation of course but for me i decided that i didn't want a script also i didn't want to use presentation slides on a screen with lots of words or information on them again that's an automatic thing people just assume that you have to have slides there has to be a visual element to your presentation not necessarily you are the visual element you can do it with your with your body and I don't mean like strip off your T-shirt and do a show. I just mean, you know, with your body language, you can be engaging and you can use your eyes to kind of engage the room. Don't don't make your eyes pop out. But you know what I mean? Slides can be good, but they can also be very distracting. It's human nature for the audience to just stare at the slides and then you lose the connection with them because they're looking at the slides. You're trying to talk to them. They don't know if they should look at you or look at them. They're, the monkey brain inside is going, look at the, look at the colourful, th- bright thing. And then they're, are they reading? Are they listening to you? What's going on? That can actually be very distracting. And then you lose the connection with them. And also an old rule from stand-up comedy is this. An old rule is if it's not adding anything, then it's taking something away. And sometimes slides are not really adding anything to your talk. And so they just take away the focus from you and cause the audience to get distracted, especially when there's lots of text and they end up reading rather than listening to you. So slides are only important if you've got specific things to show. If you're showing financial figures or other data or whatever, then yes. But otherwise, they're not really that necessary or at least keep them very, very minimal, just like one picture one message you know nothing is better than just trying to establish a good connection with the people in front of you so i decided to do it without a script and without any slides just like in a stand-up show now doing it without a script can seem a bit daunting though can't it right it can make you nervous because you can think oh god how do i get it right how can i be sure i'm going to remember to say all the right things Well, yeah, basically, in my experience, you have to just try to get to know your subject really well, then create a simple structure for your talk, something kind of clear. Now, you might have that structure on paper in front of you or just something really basic that you can't forget. You have your basic structure and then you just practice a lot. And, and, you know, you practice a lot. You practice doing it, reading out, speaking it. And then you just trust yourself to be able to do it on the day or on the night and so that's what I try to do now I realize that I'm talking like some kind of expert public speaker here (laughs) the master of public speaking obviously I'm not but I do have some experience from teaching and from doing stand-up comedy so you know I'm just trying to share my experience with you in the weeks and days leading up to the talk the talk, which, to be honest, there wasn't a lot of pressure. It wasn't like, Luke, if you if you fail to explain the Beatles, then uh, your contract will be terminated. It, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like, if you can't explain this cultural topic, Luke, then I'm afraid you will be um, <laughs> you'll be sent back to Britain. Uh, your passport will be ripped up, um, and you will be separated from your French family. And that's it, basically. Also, your your internet connection will be cut off forever. So it, there was no pressure. But anyway, 
I thought about it a lot. I thought about the specific focus. I wrote some ideas down when they came to me. I asked people for their advice. I talked out loud to myself, imagining I was doing it. And then I did write some some um, some script. I did actually write some script, but then I boiled it down to a list of simple one or two word prompts. I then printed out those prompts on some cards. The prompts were just simple things, just simple one word reminders of the main sections of the presentation. I mean, I'll give you the first one. The first prompt was just simply hello, uh, just to remind me to say hello to the audience. The next card said, who are you? And that was just to remind me who I am um, and to introduce myself. You know, it was pretty basic things like that. You'll hear me mention the cards a little bit at the start. So I had these prompts in my hand. The idea is that I could just glance at the card and then ramble on that topic, hopefully remembering the main things I wanted to say. I also wanted to leave myself room to improvise and respond to what was happening in the room, because in my experience, that's the best way to keep things entertaining and to stop the audience falling asleep at all. Uh, I also wrote a few other things on the cards in pencil, just a few other things like a couple of names, dates and quotes, just in case I forgot them uh, while talking. So that's what I did as preparation. And in a moment, I promise you can hear how it went. Let me just say a couple of very basic facts about the Beatles for listeners who are new to the subject, just so you don't get lost. OK, now the people in the room for my talk were probably already fans of the Beatles to a, to a certain extent. But you might be new to them, right? Of course, you might be thinking, the who, the, the Beatles, the what? Um, let me just tell you the basics, all right, uh, in about one minute. So the Beatles, they were a group of musicians, a band from Liverpool in England who recorded and released music together, uh, pop music uh, from 1962 to 1970, more or less. The members of the group were John Lennon uh, on guitar and vocals, Paul McCartney on bass guitar and vocals, George Harrison on lead guitar and vocals, uh, Ringo Starr on drums and vocals sometimes. Uh, Later on, they played different instruments and they used all sorts of different instruments and recording techniques, but in the early days, those were the things they did. Also, there were other members uh, in the early days, Pete Best, was uh, the original drummer, and Stuart Sutcliffe was a member of the band as well. Um, They were in the band before the Beatles became really famous. So the Beatles formed in the late 1950s. They played live concerts together from the early days in Liverpool and Hamburg in Germany until the year 1966 when they Um, when they were playing stadiums and huge theatres around the world, but that's when they stopped performing live in 1966, when they basically had, you know, reached the pinnacle of what you can achieve as a performing band, and they couldn't hear themselves playing their music on stage because of the audience screaming so loud. They stopped performing live, and they concentrated on making music in the studio. Um, They released a number of albums, about 12 albums, I think, more or less, give or take, it depends. Some people, is Yellow Submarine an album? You know, about 12 albums and a number of sing- singles. Uh, the band broke up officially in 1970 and they went their separate ways. There was always speculation about whether the band would reunite. But then in 1980, John Lennon was killed, um, meaning that the four members could never reunite again as a band. Uh, The Beatles were not just commercially successful, they also represented a huge cultural shift and also were groundbreaking in many ways beyond just their influence on popular music. They were also just very funny, stylish and charming and their message was ultimately one of peace and love. So, Why We Love the Beatles, that's the title of the talk, and that's what I talked about a couple of weeks ago, and that's what you can hear now in this first episode of Luke's English Podcast, recorded in front of a live audience. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Thanks, Phil. Hello. 
Good evening. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Good. That's the first. That's my first card. Hello. Good. That's been done then. Hi. How are you? Yeah. 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 Good. No. Not bad. Huh? What? How about me? Yeah. Not bad too. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for asking. Uh, very nice to be here as more people arrive. Right, so, well, my next card is, who are you? Now, that's me. Now, some of you know who I am because... Have, have I got any of my students here, by the way? And it's some of my students are... No, not many. Most of them are at home doing their homework, <laughs> obviously, which is good. So, I'm Luke. I'm from England, just in case you were wondering about my accent. <laughs> I know you're listening, going, how? Ah, what's... Try and understand him. Where is he from? What is this? Yeah, this is British English. So just in case you're wondering, this is how the English language is supposed to sound. <laughs> just jokes. Um, so, uh, yes, so I'm from England, and, uh, well, I should tell you... By the way, by the way, I've got a microphone on, as you can see here. Now, this, obviously, I'm not broadcasting, we're not, I'm not broadcasting my voice through the speakers. Uh, we tried that, we have tried that with a microphone, uh, but the ceiling is just too high... And so the sound bounces around, it's too echoey. Looks fantastic, looks beautiful, sounds terrible. All right, so, so, uh, so but no, but I am, I'm recording this because I'm going to uh, publish this as an episode of my podcast because I have a podcast for learners of English. It's called Luke's English Podcast. Luke's English, that's not the luxury English podcast. <laughs> I have said that to French people. It's Luke's English podcast. And they're like, what, luxury English podcast? What is it about? Gold? What's, what's all that? Um, so no, Luke's English podcast is the name. So it's a podcast for learners of English. So I'm recording this. I will publish it as an episode. If this goes well. I mean, if... <laughs> If this doesn't go well, I'll just go home, I'll take the recording, and I'll just delete it, okay? Or I'll, I'll take my recorder, I'll just throw it in the river, Sen, and we'll, no one will ever know, and your memories, well, hopefully you'll just drink enough wine at the end, so you'll just forget about the entire presentation completely. I don't know. But if it goes well, then I, I will publish it. So, uh, you know, if you do fall asleep during my talk, um, and <laughs> you want to know what you missed then you will be able to listen to the recording uh, later. And actually, so yeah, I do, I have an audience. As I've obviously, all of you good people here in the room today, but obviously listening to this as well, not now, it's not live, but listening to this later will be my podcast audience. And there's, you know, there, there's quite a lot of them, you know, they're all around the world as well. If you can imagine sort of like Stade de France, maybe a Stade de France and a half, of people around the world listening to this as well in different countries. Like, name a country, just name a country. Like, Germany. Yes, I have listeners in Germany. Hello, Germany. <laughs> are, you, are you German? No, I'm French, but I do speak German as well. You do speak German as well? Okay, Should there, well, there's, a, there's a German speaker in the room. Um, okay, very good. So I should, say, I should say hello to my podcast audience. Hello to the listeners in podcast land. It started. It started. The talk has started. Yeah, so here we are. I'll, I'll just describe the scene for them, just so that they know. So I, I'm in the Turner Room in the uh, Anvalide Centre of the British Council, everyone, OK? And they've, there are these amazing windows, right? Yeah, it's true, isn't it? With a beautiful view of the Eiffel Tower just over there across the river, the River Seine. Here we are on the left bank uh, of the river. It's, it's, a, it's a very nice spot. Uh, so yes, there we go. That's the that's the situation. And I've got I've got an audience of people in front of me. Everybody, there's about I don't know. There's like maybe fifty people in the room, and they're all just staring at me. Like, come on, <laughs> tell us about the Beatles. What's you know? Get on with it. That's probably what they're all thinking. So hello, everybody. I've said that. That was my, that was another card. But um, who, French people. Who are the French people? Make some noise if you're French. Don't, yeah, yay! There, that's right. Don't just put your hand up. They don't know. It's an audio episode. Very nice to have you here, French people. Who, any non-French people in the room? Ooh, the two English teachers at the back of the room. <laughs> and you kind of like raised your hand a little bit. Well, yeah, kind of like uh, Sri Lanka, right? Yeah, yeah. Were, were the Beatles were popular in, in Sri Lanka? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they kind of got around a bit, didn't they? 
I mean, <laughs> apparently. Uh, no, they, they're kind of popular everywhere. Uh, where, whereabouts are you from? Well, I'm from Tibet, but I grew up in India, so... Ah, there's, of course, a Beatle connection to India, uh, of course, as I might explain later if there's time, if I actually start this presentation <laughs> at some point. Um, all right, very nice to have you. Shall I give you some Beatle fun facts about Paris? And this is where you'll go, yes, please, Luke, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Okay, fun facts about the Beatles and, and Paris. So, first of all, the haircut, the Beatle haircut, the mop top, as it's known. Did you know that was born in Paris? Did you know that? You didn't know that. You're all surprised because you're thinking that doesn't look very Parisian or something. I don't know. But, that, yeah, that was born in Paris, the, the Beatle haircut. Would you like me to tell the story? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So, so, the Beatles, back in the 50s, you know, sort of uh, late 50s is when they first started performing together and the early 60s, they were rockers, right? They were, so they were into rock and roll music. They wore leather and cowboy boots and stuff and they had their hair in the sort of rock and roll style, the Johnny Halliday, you know, whatever, the Elvis, uh, the Tony Curtis, whatever you want to call it, that kind of rock and roll haircut. But then they went to Germany, right? They went to Hamburg and performed in Hamburg a number of times because, as I'll explain later probably, there was a need for rock and roll bands to perform to the sailors and people that went out in the, in the sort of the, the dodgy part of Hamburg where there were lots of clubs and things. So lots of bands were brought over and the Beatles were one of those bands. And when they were in Hamburg in the early 60s, they met some German students and made friends with them. They were sort of artistic, uh, intellectual German students. There was mainly three of them, uh, Astrid Kircher, uh, Klaus Vormann and Jürgen Vollmer were their names. And they were called Exes. That was like the nickname of their group, Exes, meaning existentialists, because they were into existential French philosophy, actually, Jean-Paul Sartre and, and sort of thing, that sort of thing. And they loved French cinema, the French New Wave cinema. And there was uh, one film in particular, and I have to look at my notes here to, to name this film, Jean-Claude Brialy. How do you, yeah. Yeah, how do you pronounce that properly? Do I do it right? Yeah. I did it right, listeners. <laughs> I pronounced it well. Uh, there's a film called Le Beau Serge. Yeah. Le Beau. Oh. Le Beau Serge. No, I'll just say it like a, The Beau Serge. <laughs> right? 1958 film, Jean Claude Brielli. And in that film, he had a, this sort of haircut. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was kind of combed forward a little bit, a sort of proto Beatles haircut. Right? And Klaus Vormann, who was Astrid's boyfriend, they watched the film together and he said to Astrid, can you do my hair like that because he looked really cool. You're writing notes. There's two people writing this down, listeners. <laughs> I've got two people making notes. Really? Wow, this is great. Can you not just remember the... the like, is this all new information? You know this is like on the internet. You know that, don't you? You could just Google the Beatles and all of this information is there. Be like, no, it's not come from Luke Thompson's mouth. So, <laughs> so it's not worth noting down. This is great. Does that help you understand English if you write while you're listening? Does that help? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so, so Klaus Vormann, you know, they uh, said, do my hair like that. And then they started adopting that hairstyle because they thought it was cool. And it was, you know. And, and so they had this kind of combed forward mushroom top hairstyle. And then Stuart Sutcliffe, who was one of the Beatles... Uh, some of you are nodding your head like, yes, yeah, Stuart Sutcliffe, I know my Beatles history. Other people are like, who? <laughs> he was the, one of the fifth Beatles. There's a number of fifth Beatles, but he was one of them. Uh, he was in the band um, before they actually made, became famous and stuff. Uh, Stuart Sutcliffe, when he met Astrid, they fell in love. It was very romantic. Uh, and uh, he asked her, she did his hair like that too. And then he went on stage with the Beatles and they all laughed at him. Like, look at that ridiculous haircut. They all made fun of him. Uh, George, meanwhile, quite liked it, and he got Astrid to do it too. And then the, the John and Paul were a bit late, and they kind of, it wasn't, wasn't until 1961 when on John's 21st birthday, he received £100 from a rich Scottish uncle. 
right? Now, £100 in those days was quite a lot of money. So on his 21st birthday, John got £100 from his uncle, which was, you know, a lot of money. And what did they do with it? They went hitchhiking. Where did they go hitchhiking to? They went to, of course. No, they, went to, they wanted to go to Spain. <laughs> but they ended up in Paris. They got as far as Paris. They hitchhiked to Paris. And when they were there, they, they bumped into Jürgen Vollmer, one of their old friends from Germany. And he had the haircut, and his, his friends, his French student friends, had the haircut too. And uh, so John and Paul were like, can you, can you do our hair like that? You know, after like a few months before they'd been making fun of their friend Stuart for having their hair cut, they were like, actually, you know, now we're in Paris and everything. Uh, can you do our hair like that as well? And then they came back and then voila, that was, the, that was the beginning of the Beatle haircut. So it was born in Paris, inspired by French New Wave cinema. Thanks, France, for, uh, for giving us that haircut. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 1964, the Beatles were in France, in Paris. They stayed at the Georges Sank Hotel on the Champs-Élysées, just over there, um, for 20 nights. They performed 18 shows at which venue? The Olympia, of course. And uh, while they were here, they received some news. Do you know what the news was that they received in January 1964? You're like shaking your head like, I don't know. Uh, yes? They got their number one, their first number one record in the USA, which was a very big deal for a British band from Liverpool. They got their first number one, and America was going Beatle crazy. So that was a very big moment for them, and they celebrated by drinking champagne, of course. Um, I think they were already drinking champagne, <laughs> to, be, to be fair. Like, more champagne, why not? Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was the moment they realised they'd become a truly international, sort of pan-continental, you know, phenomenon. So there's that. Lyrics, mentions of Paris or France in the lyrics of Beatles songs. Can you think of any? I am the walrus. I am the walrus, yes. Ten points. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know you were getting points tonight? <laughs> he got 10. You've all got none. Okay, come on, everybody. So, uh, what, do you know what the lyric is? It talks about the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. It does. It's about the Eiffel Tower, yeah. Uh, apart from that, uh, also the Ballad of John and Yoko. The Ballad of John and Yoko. 10 points to, to the man here, too. Well, you've got a competitor. <laughs> yeah. So, so I am the walrus, which is a sort of a nonsense song, arguably. The lyrics are really weird. It contains the line, Semolina Pilchard climbing up the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, I don't understand it either. Um, and I've read loads of Beatles books and I still don't understand it. It's not meant to be understood. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not meant to be understood. Because like John Lennon in 1967, he heard that his, at his old school where he used to go, where he was quite a bad student, quite a rebellious student, they were actually studying his own lyrics in classes. He heard this and he said, I think I'll just write a song that's sort of really meaningless in order to give, my, give these kids a really hard time. So he wrote I Am The Walrus and a lot of it's just sort of nonsense imagery. It's sort of very inspired by Lewis Carroll and things like that. And Semolina Pilchard climbing up the Eiffel Tower. A pilchard is a fish. So it's the image of a fish made of semolina. Semoule in, in French, right? A fish made of couscous. <laughs> Climbing up the Eiffel Tower. Okay, John. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I don't know what he was smoking at the time. Actually, I, I do know what he was smoking at the time. I do. Um, and as you said, the Ballad of John and Yoko, which is a song about you know, John and Yoko's relationship and their marriage, and it contains lines describing how they got married and how they're dealing with the press and stuff like that. Um, the line is... <laughs> finally made the plane into Paris honeymooning down by the Seine so that's the he talks about the fact that he had him and Yoko had their honeymoon in Paris down by the river Seine just over there which is quite nice isn't it so there you go fun facts fun facts right so shall I start <laughs> <laughs>
So um, the, the, the aim of this presentation is, yeah, well, the title is Why We Love the Beatles. And I'm assuming that we love the Beatles. I mean, I do. I know that much. I mean, I suppose you do too, yes? Anyone in here doesn't love the Beatles? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe someone got dragged along by a friend. Come on, I want to go out and drink beer. Just come to this thing. It'll be good for your English. Oh, the Beatles. So, all right, so you know, you love the Beatles too? Yeah. Okay, and so I suppose you know why you love the Beatles. Because if you, I mean, if if you know already, I don't need to do this. (laughs) We can just go and drink wine and, you know... But, all right, I'll try and explain it in English. But that's the aim, is to try to explain the appeal of this band from the moment that they became a huge success in the 60s and Beatlemania happened, all the way up until today, because I think there's still... I mean, obviously, the presence of this massive audience of people here tonight uh, is uh, proof of the (laughs) enduring uh, popularity of the band, right? Um, I mean, they are still popular. I mean, like the Disney Plus series that came out, you know, Peter Jackson's Disney Plus's Get the Beatles Get Back. I don't know if you have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't like Disney Plus and I will not give them my money. You haven't seen it yet. Oh, you must. You must. Yes, Guillaume has seen it. Yeah, what did you think? Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's the first major Beatles stuff that we've had for a long, long time. Don't get me started because we will need another 45-minute presentation for me to just talk about that. But yeah, the, the, so I mean, I've, I'm going to try and break it down into a few different categories. So there's the, the, the music, of course, their personalities, um, the story of the Beatles, because it is an epic, incredible human story. Um, and the internal dynamic between the members of the band, which is fascinating and endlessly compelling, just to work out their relationship and what was going on between them, and just to enjoy sort of somehow being part of their friendship in some way. Um, And so that's what I'm going to try and do. I'm no expert. Uh, I don't need to really go on about that. I've, I've listened to loads of the music. I've read lots of the books, but I'm no expert. I've listened to lots of podcasts about the Beatles, but not all of them. I've watched loads of videos, listened to loads. My uncle met Paul McCartney once. Does that help? Um, yeah, 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 he did. Yeah. So when? In, uh, I don't know, it was like a few years ago, fairly recently. In, in Rye. Do you know Rye? Rye. It's a place in England. East Sussex, exactly. Ten points to fill. Ten points for that. <laughs> Where is Rye? Where is Rye gets the English man 10 points. Whereas Can You Name the Beatles references to Paris in their songs also gets you 10 points. So basically, if you speak, you get points. You see how this works? Um, So, yeah, in Rye, which is a town on the south coast of England, and Paul has got a studio there. Okay, you can Google it. There's actually, you can, there's Google map image of it. So if you want to visit, you can find it. I don't know if he will let you in dun, dun, dun. Paul, Luke said <laughs> like, who's Luke? anyway, um, so my uncle was in an art shop in Rye just like buying some art as you do, and he was in the queue, because you know we like queuing yeah. in England you know, he, was in, he was being a good English person and queuing and he heard someone talking in front of him, and he thought I know that voice and it was probably someone sort of going, oh, yeah, I'll just pay by credit card. You know, that's fine. <laughs> you know, I was in the Beatles, you know, you know. Yeah, I actually knew John Lennon. And my uncle Nick was like, I know that voice. And, and then the guy turned round and it was Paul McCartney just there. Like the real Paul McCartney actually standing there with his legs and everything. <laughs> and my uncle who's brilliant at this sort of thing. He's really good at meeting famous people. I am terrible at meeting famous people because I just don't know what to say and then I say something stupid and make a fool of myself and then they don't know what to say and then uh, uh, it gets awkward and then I regret it for the rest of my life. (laughs) Um, But my uncle is very good at that and he just went, Paul! Like that. Paul! Like his, his old friend Paul who he hasn't seen. Paul! 
Paul, he said to him like that, and Paul was just like, hi! <laughs> Because Paul McCartney's great, and he is really good, apparently, at being a normal human. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, Paul and my uncle's like, Paul, what are you doing here? And Paul's like, I'm just buying some art stuff. <laughs> what are you doing here? And, you know, and it was that kind of conversation. They got talking, and Nick had his camera, because he'd been taking pictures of birds, because my uncle Nick is a big bird watcher. And uh, so he's like, what have you got your camera? You've got your camera there. You know, a nice camera. It's a Canon. And because, uh, you know, Paul's wife at the time, Linda, was a photographer. So, you know, he's into photography. And, you know, oh, my, my wife's a photographer. And Nick's like, yeah, I know. I know. I know. You know, and they were bonding and stuff. And he showed in the pictures. I've been taking pictures of birds. And he showed in the pictures of the birds. And Paul's like, oh, it's, you know, really nice. And then he showed him one. It's uh, this grey bird. He's like, oh, that's a grey wagtail. He said, that's my favourite bird. And they became great friends, and, and then they never saw each other again. <laughs> but I don't know if that helps give me any qualifications or credentials to do this talk, which I will do one day. Um, but anyway, so, um, okay, so their music, let me try, let me try and explain this. This is going to be difficult, trying to explain the appeal of the Beatles. It's like trying to explain the unexplainable in a way. Um, how do I explain a massive global psychological, cultural, social, political phenomenon in well, how many minutes have I got left? <laughs> Ten? I don't know. Uh, it's going to be difficult, but I guess, I mean, as you know, what do you think? Well, I, never mind. It's all right. Um, uh, let me try. So I think one of the things is, um, so they, sort of, they transcended their time is one of the things. So if you actually look on Spotify and look at the numbers of monthly listens for different artists, right? Do you have any idea how many monthly listens the Beatles get on Spotify these days, this month. Any idea? Must be impressive. Must be impressive. What, what, like ballpark figure? No. Sorry? Millions. Millions. Three million? Four million? It's 25 million monthly listens for the Beatles on, on Spotify at the moment. Rolling Stones, they're competitors of the time. How many monthly listens? More or less? Well... It's less, yeah, it's less. 19 million. Um, well, I had other data. Where's the rest of my data? Elvis Presley, iconic American rock and roll, the king of rock and roll, 12 million. Take that, Elvis. <laughs> Comparing it to... Uh, hmm, do you want to know Johnny Halliday? <laughs> really? The French artist of this genre... 1.3 million. Yeah. But it's all right, because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's French. It doesn't have the same international appeal to the same extent, you know. It's, um, and he only died recently, so, you know. Okay, that was, that was bad taste. <laughs> I will edit that joke out. Uh, Kanye West, 78 million. There's a depressing number for you. <laughs> Justin Bieber, 46 million. Taylor Swift, 55 million. But still 25 million, considering they stopped in 1970, you know, which is a long time ago, you know, it's still pretty impressive. So they're clearly very relevant. They transcended their time. A lot of the other artists of the time played music that was sort of restricted to the style of the time, but somehow the Beatles transcended that and they made music which I think is timeless in some way. It must be because young people are getting into their music now uh, in, in, you know, in the same way uh, in terms of songwriting. So they weren't, they weren't trained musicians. They didn't have musical theory. They didn't know about musical theory when they wrote their songs. In fact, they just learnt their chords one by one by working them out or by learning them from friends who'd worked them out. And apparently there's a story that Paul McCartney tells sometimes about how he learnt something like the B7 chord, which was like a new chord. For them, you know, they knew G and C and maybe like E and A or something. And B7 was a, you know, one that they didn't know. And they heard that someone on the other side of Liverpool knew what B7 was. So they're like, quick, get in the bus. And they went over to the other side of town. He knows B7. They actually took a day trip just to learn this one chord. But so they didn't have musical theory. But I think like this sort of liberated them 
in a way. Like they didn't know what the rules were, and so they just broke them naturally. Um, they, um, they, they had so many rich influences which informed their, you know, their songwriting. And you know, they, they took in influences like you know, rock and roll and rhythm and blues music, of course, from the United States, but also other things, like wider things, like music hall and classical and jazz and um, all sorts of other things. And I think they managed to put those things into their music, um, making it unique. Um, the musicianship... Now, they weren't necessarily the best skilled musicians out there. You know, you think of someone like Eric Clapton or, you know, the members of Cream who were amazing, you know, uh, improvisers and masters of their instruments. The Beatles weren't really in that category. But somehow, but it was the songwriting, I think, and they focused on the songs. And that was what sort of, that's what they focused on. And the, the, the whole was greater than the sum of its parts. You know that expression in English? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the four members of the band, you take them apart separately and take their value as musicians, and the, if you put them as numbers... I can't explain maths. I can't. I was about to try and explain that as a mathematical metaphor. I can't. Basically, put them together, and it's more than just four. The value becomes greater. There you go. All right, that's why I'm an English teacher and not a maths person. Don't know numbers. Um, singing. I mean, the singing maybe is the most special thing, really. It's the way that their voices blended. The harmonies. Their voices blended in, a, in, a, in the perfect way. Their, their voices were so complementary, especially John and Paul. You know, uh, John's voice, especially in the earlier days, was sort of earthy and... Uh, a bit rough sounding. Paul had the ability to sing very high. He could hit the higher notes. And, you know, the, the qualities of their voices were different, but complementary. And when they put them together, it sounded fantastic. It just, it really did. And then George was able to, you know, go in the middle somehow and just create something that was very full of character and personality. Um, in terms of their songs, you know, many, many different styles. There's you know, they never stayed the same for too long. They changed a lot, and so there's so much variety in their music. Um, next thing would be the personality, right? Just the personality. I mean, uh, I guess if you... Most of you are French. Um, I, don't know, I don't know. Have you seen much interview footage? Have you watched them talking? Have you seen them interacting outside of the music? Have you sort of observed that? Not so much, right? Okay, because well, that's... A pity, because you're really missing out on, for me, what is maybe 50% of the show, which is it's not just the music, which I love, but I love to just watch them talking and watch them interacting. They were so funny. They were so witty and clever and natural as well. A lot of entertainers in the 60s and early 60s were sort of like entertainers, cheesy kind of entertainers who had a sort of a professional... Um, sort of way of talking to audiences uh, and an image and stuff. And the Beatles, they just were just themselves. You know, they just came up and they just were totally natural and, were, and they were themselves. And that was so refreshing. And it's still refreshing now, even when you watch video of them. Some of the people around them, like the cheesy presenters, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage, the Beatles. And then they're like, hi, you know, we're the Beatles. They just look like modern people in the past because they were just so, so natural. And their humor is, I mean, it's, if you get a chance to watch some of their videos, I hope you can understand what they're saying, not because of the Liverpool accents, but because of the sound quality from the old videos. But they are very, very funny. The story... I don't know, are you familiar with the story of the Beatles? You're shaking your head like, I don't know what, I don't even know how I ended up in this room. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I turned left, I should have turned right. <laughs> um, who, what are the Beatles? Can you explain? Um, so the story of the Beatles, I'm sure I don't have time to explain the whole story. Linda's going, yes, you do. Yeah, don't worry, there's wine, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> They warned you that this would exceptionally end at midnight. Oh, really, did they? Did everyone know that? 
you're here until midnight, all right? The metro will be closed by the time this is finished. And <laughs> I'm joking, of course. So, uh, all right, let me try and give the story of the Beatles as quickly as I can. <sighs> See, the thing about it is it's an epic story. It's like the most epic story with, ev- with everything in it. It's got tragedy and success and love and, uh, I don't know, name a thing. Just say, name a thing. Apples, they're in it. Uh, you know, what, what, just name a thing that dogs, there's dogs in the story whatever you want, there, it's in the story of the Beatles um, yeah, you're looking at me like, why are you talking about dogs and apples, I don't, it's just the first thing that came into my head, but those are in the story they really are, so okay born obviously the four of them, John, Paul George and Ringo, okay, got it um, those are the four Beatles, John Lennon Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and also some others um, as well but uh, John, Paul, George and Ringo so they were all born during World War II obviously in Liverpool in the northwest of England Liverpool is a fascinating town uh, I lived there for four years um, and then left I never went back uh, it's too cold uh, no but um, it's, a, it's a great place and uh, what Liverpool is known for is well it used to be a really important city in the industrial period a really really big and important port Um, and then after the industrial period after we moved on from that Liverpool sort of went into decline to an extent Uh, but what you've got there is that a lot of remnants from that period a slightly multicultural community Uh, it's a mix of obviously English but uh, Irish a lot of Irish families uh, moved to Liverpool. There's Chinese communities, uh, Caribbean communities there. It's a multicultural place. It being a port, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people work uh, on boats, you know, sea, uh, merchant seamen, a lot of people coming and going uh, from different parts of the world. Um, and Liverpool is a place that's known for its humour as well. Like, it's really unique. It's a unique part of England. Engl- England is known for having humour anyway, but especially in Liverpool. It's, like, really strong, a really strong part of their character. And, the bi- and it's a tough place as well. It's a tough town. You've got to be funny and quite tough. And they were. They, they were definitely a product of their city. That toughness and that naturalness and the humour, the n- no-bullshit as well as a, a, a thing about Liverpool, and they really brought that with them. Um, so, born in, born in Liverpool uh, during the Second World War, uh, lived in, obviously grew up in the 50s, and as far as I can tell, the 50s were just black and white, right? Everything was just black and white in the 50s. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, I thought that might be funnier than it was, but you're just like, yeah, black and white, okay, fine. <laughs> Like, you see the video footage, the photographs, it was all in black and white. And as far as I can tell, life was kind of like black and white as well, sort of. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was like the, 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 the grown-ups. It was the world of the grown-ups. And the grown-ups were the generation who'd lived during the war and maybe the other war as well. And so they just wanted a quiet kind of time and, and everything was a bit sensible and restrictive. But there was this sort of youth movement, the baby boom, and that was about more and then changes in society. I'm sure you know the whole story. I can't explain all of the cultural and social movements in society in about, what, 30 seconds now? Uh, I know you want wine. But then, then uh, and, and rock and roll music arrived, which was exciting. You know, it wasn't black and white. It was in colour. It was in technicolour. And um, that was incredibly inspiring and exciting. In terms of the individual lives of the Beatles, you probably know the main things that Paul... Uh, I mean, there was some tragedy in there. Like Paul McCartney, his, he lost his mother. His mother died when he was 14 years old. And John's mother died as well when he was 17. Now, I don't want to dwell on that, but I think it is significant that they both shared that loss. And it was one of the things that really brought them close together in a way that no one else could understand they had they shared something in that kind of grief they had that in common and it really brought them together in a in a almost sort of supernatural way it's hard to explain but they were incredibly close and had that thing in common which which brought them together it was john's band really originally the quarry men 
You know, it was the band that he formed with his friends from school and Paul saw them performing on stage and John invited him to perform because he noticed that, you know, when they met, Paul played a song on the guitar the other way around because Paul's left-handed and Paul's like, you know, can I have a go on your guitar? That's my Paul McCartney impression, (laughs) by the way. I'm not just going weird for a moment. That's the Paul McCartney impression. But you don't know because you don't know what he sounds like, do you, French people? Do you? I don't know. Well, he sounds like this. Exactly. (laughs) Like this. And uh, it was like, oh, I'll just, you know, give us a go on your guitar. And he flipped it over or played it upside down and convincingly played a song. And John was like, that was pretty good. What's your name? You know, that's John Lennon. That's a John Lennon impression. Less good than my Paul McCartney. Trust, you'll have to trust me on that one. Uh, anyway, he was impressed. John was impressed by his skill, and, and, he was, and he joined the band. And George came later. George was Paul, Paul's friend. He was younger. He knew him from the bus. He was his mate from the bus. And they joined... And they played music and they sort of knocked around Liverpool trying to learn how to play songs properly. And they desperately needed a drummer because one day they got invited to go to Hamburg in Germany, right? Because they were looking for bands, rock and roll bands. And there, were, there was a promoter who was like, we need rock and roll bands for Germany, quick. Who can we find? And there were a few bands. And then like, what about these guys? What are they called? The Beatles. Oh, come on, you can come too. And uh, they weren't very good, but they needed a drummer. And so they found Pete Best, who ironically was not the best uh, drummer, despite the name. And uh, but I think the reason they got him is because A, he had a drum kit, and, and B, his mum had a, a venue, a place, a coffee shop, with a room downstairs where they performed uh, music. And so, you know, it was quite a good political move to get him in the band sort of thing, you know, because like, all right, we need a drummer and his mum owns a place where we can perform. Anyway, they all went to Germany. How much? <laughs> and then they became a big success. <laughs> and then we all drank wine. <laughs> the end. No? <laughs> no, I can't end there, can I? I don't know what I could do. I, I'll try and summarise it. So they played a thousand and million hours of shows in Germany in very bad conditions they slept in a toilet sometimes like they the, the conditions were terrible you know the the german owner of the club where they were going to play was like okay so this is where you perform and then behind the this curtain that is where you sleep and these are the toilets you know and that was kind of the the conditions those are the conditions they lived in and um it was tough and they were playing seven or eight hours of music a night how did they survive I don't know, some amphetamines might have been involved. Um, There were these diet pills that went round that the waiters and waitresses would take. Preludin, it was called. And apparently preludin was shared. And they were fueled on preludin and preludin, as far as I can tell. That was it. And uh, (laughs) uh, I think, you know, legal. It was legal, uh, I think, anyway. But, you know, you can imagine the situation where they're just playing these long shows. It's very hard. uh, But they learn how to be a band. Stuart Sutcliffe was also, was John's friend, and he was also in the band. He was a painter. I mentioned him before. He fell in love with the German girl. He decided to stay in Germany when the other lads continued. So he sort of left the band. And it's, it is tragic because he actually died. He, he had um, a sudden brain hemorrhage and died suddenly. It's totally tragic. Uh, the, the story is full of these sorts of things. Um, it, it's, it's really terrible and sad, uh, you know, but they continued and they became more and more successful. They went back to Liverpool after becoming a great band in Germany. And in Liverpool, they played shows and they were billed as the Beatles from Germany, from Hamburg in Germany. And the local people thought they were German. And they were like, your English is really good. <laughs> Like, no, 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 we're from here. We're, we're, we're English. And, you know, they performed at the Cavern Club, still with Pete Best. Um, they, they were a, a manager, a local manager from a record shop nearby, heard about them and came to visit them. And he was like, these, these boys have got something. I'm going to sign them up to my new record label or I'm going to sign them up as, 
as their man he became their manager and so he started to try to shop them around he changed their image convinced them to wear suits instead of the leather outfits that they'd been wearing to make them a bit more presentable for tv and stuff he uh, sold them he tried to get a record label they failed a number of times. They kept failing and failing and failing because all the record executives were like, hmm, who's next? The Beatles. Hmm, okay, let's hear the tape. No, I don't think so. So all of the uh, record executives like, said no until finally George Martin met them. He said, okay, these boys, they might have something. Bring them down to the studio. We'll see what they can do. And he brought them down. He did a session with them. And he's like, hmm, okay, the drummer's not that great. But I think they've got something. And apparently he said that it was actually their humour that got them the record contract. That he was like, I'm not sure about the music. They're pretty good, but it's their personalities, I think, which, which will make these boys a success. And there's a story of, apparently at the end of their first session, George, who was this you know, quite, quite important person from the record company, quite a serious person, sort of said, OK, boys, so, um, you know... There you go. If you've got any questions at all, if anything you'd like to change uh, during the session, just let me know. And George Harrison said, well, I don't like your tie for a start. (laughs) And luckily, George Martin had a sense of humour and he found it charming. And he was like, you know what? I think that uh, we should sign these boys. And so they did. And then obviously they became a huge hit. They became famous in England. They conquered then they conquered Europe, and then they conquered America, and then they conquered the world, and then uh, they made films, and then they decided that playing shows in front of millions, not millions, thousands of screaming fans, girls would just go completely insane. Uh, My mum went, my mum saw the Beatles perform twice, and she was one of those, ah! She's like, Mum, why did you do that? Why were you screaming during the show? You couldn't hear them. You know, they're just like, ah, that was their response. <laughs> they weren't even listening to the music. It's just like, ah, they're actually there. I mean, it's amazing, really. It's like a weird psychological phenomenon of like, how, what happened? They just, people lost their minds in the most insane way. Like I said, they finally got number one record in America, and then they went to America, and they performed on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was the number one entertainment show in the States at the time, in February 1964, not long after JFK had been killed. It was a bad time. And then the Beatles arrived on, Ed, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and it was like, wow, apparently a lot of, a lot of people have said who saw it, it was like a, an amazing moment, you know, a sort of a shift, a cultural shift. 73 million people watched that performance that's a lot of people that's like more than the population of britain or france you know that's a lot of american families watching that show and suddenly they became you know when you become massively successful in america you pretty much become massively successful everywhere else it's like a game of risk isn't it if you take america you've got the world basically you know um and, uh, but they had to do these shows where they couldn't hear themselves, they couldn't hear each other because of the screaming. They were, the fans were throwing jelly babies at them, little sweets, because like in one interview, George was like, I quite like jelly babies. And then from then on, there you go, jelly babies! For the rest of your life, the fans just threw jelly babies at them. It got crazy, you know, really crazy, to the point where this had never happened before. These sorts of crowds of people had never got together in these numbers in this hysterical way before, in this kind of way. It was like life-threatening. They were scared sometimes. They, you know, there were times when you know, acts, bad things could have happened. It was really too much, like far too much. And uh, John made comments you know, in an interview to a journalist friend of his about how the Beatles were getting so big, they were even competing with Christianity. And he said, you know, we're even more popular than Jesus now. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Now, he didn't mean to say that they were better or anything like that. He was just commenting on the way of the world, you know, and the way pop culture was becoming such a big thing. But, of course, some newspapers in America took the quote... And they put it, you know, published it out of context. And of course, there are some 
parts of the United States of America, as you may know, where they not only read the Bible, but they maybe even add a few things <laughs> to the Bible as well. And they decided that the Beatles were a very, a very bad thing. And so they were touring through you know, these sort of uh, Midwestern states or Southern American cities and things, and they got a lot of resistance. The Ku Klux Klan, you know, those guys with the white hoods on, those guys, you know, there were times when they were um, threatening the Beatles, death threats, giving them death threats and stuff. There was one show where they were scared. They were in a, one of these theatres in one of these places and there'd been death threats and the Ku Klux Klan and, and burning records. There's a joke from a parody film about the Beatles called The Ruttles and it, there's a joke about it. It's wonderful. It's a Monty Python version of the Beatles. It's fantastic. And in that one... The joke is, like, uh, uh, <laughs> sales of records skyrocketed. People were buying the records just so they could burn them. <laughs> and it was kind of like that, like big piles of Beatle records just being burned and stuff. And they were on stage, and probably the show would have had a very bad, you know, weird atmosphere with crazy fans, but a vague sense of threat. And apparently someone um, threw some firecrackers onto the stage... And bang, 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 they went off on the stage. And apparently all the, bo- the, the, the guys were all like looking at each other, thinking, which one is it? Which one got shot? You know, that was what it was like for them. So they decided that they, they'd had enough and they didn't want to tour anymore. So they stopped. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't the end of the band because at that point they decided we can use the studio. You know, the, the story that I think Paul McCartney tells is that they'd heard about Elvis Presley who had this thing where instead of going out on tour and, visit and meeting the public, he would send his Cadillac out on tour. And it would, his Cadillac with the black uh, windows would go out on tour and people would come and see the Cadillac. He wasn't in it. He was staying, he was at home eating, probably. Um, <laughs> um, well, I mean... Uh, and <laughs> but the Beatles thought... We can do that, but with albums, we can, do, we can go in the studio and we can record our albums and send the album out on tour. And so they did, and they focused on the studio, and they really innovated, with the help of George Martin, they innovated in many different ways. And, uh, you know, we got albums like Rub, uh, Revolver and Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road and, and so on. There's a lot more to the story than that, of course, you know, with, uh, you know, many different twists and turns the influence of Indian um, philosophy and transcendental meditation, uh, drugs and the impact that drugs had on the band. They managed to keep going and recording all the way through until the end of the 60s, as you probably know. But the story goes on. This is the most amazing thing about it, is that the more you read about the story, the more fascinating it becomes. And if you're basically, even if you don't like the music, you know, like because... You know, music is is a subjective thing. It's a question of taste. But I think with the story, I do think there is a universal, something universally interesting. If you're interested in humans and human psychology and extraordinary things, then surely the Beatles story is is an interesting one. And, you know, the book, read the books, read, read all the books. You can't, actually, there's too many of them. Um, I would talk about the internal dynamic between them. There isn't time. But it was, there was, the relationship between the members of the band was fascinating, especially John and Paul. And, um, you'll, yeah. Just watch the Get Back documentary really closely, and you sort of see some of the dynamics that are going on there. And in the end, it was all about love, wasn't it? I mean, you know, the title of the, this talk is Why We Love the Beatles, and love is the word because they sang about it. I actually checked it out. The most common words in Beatles song lyrics. I googled it and I found out because someone has found out. Someone has counted them. Uh, And uh, so all the words in the top ten are all grammar words like pronouns or auxiliary verbs. It's all it's all like you and I and be and the and stuff like that. And then in there the only meaningful lexical word in there is love and it's the eighth most common word in their songs i mean you know the song all you need is love kind of helps 
Because if you think about the, the verse, it goes like this. Love, 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 love. All you need is love. So, of course, it's going to be number eight in the list, not to mention all the other ones. But it's true. I think love was what it was all about. They sang about love. They sort of gave out some, they, they, they sort of brought love to the world in a, in a way. Uh, we loved them. They loved us. They loved each other. It was all about peace and love. And like the last line of their, the song on, at the end of at the Abbey Road album, in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make, which I think is quite an appropriate way to stop. So that's the end. Thanks. Thank you. Wine. <laughs> Come and have a drink now. So there you have it. That was my talk about the Beatles at the British Council. And um, I'm not completely sure if I managed to answer the question of why people love them so much. I don't know if I really got to the bottom of it. But ultimately, I think I managed to entertain my small audience and everyone seemed to enjoy themselves. And maybe that's the most important thing at the end of the day and the beginning of the day and the middle of the day, any time of day, really. Maybe that's the main thing is that everyone had a jolly good time and that was nice and fine. So I wonder how that was for you listening to this in podcast land. I've got a couple of questions for you. uh, About three questions ish. So first of all, did I manage to tell you something new about the Beatles that you didn't know before? First question. Second question. If you're not a fan of the band, did I give you a sense of why people love them so much, including the fact that it's not just about the music? Um, and there's more to them than just Yellow Submarine, Yesterday, Hey Jude, and Let It Be, right? Did I give you a sense of why people love them so much, if you're not a fan? And what was it like, thirdly, what was it like listening to a podcast that was recorded live in front of an audience, and should I do more episodes like that in the future? Actually, I have sort of already decided that I would like to do more stuff like this in the future, and I would like to do talks at the British Council that can also be published as podcasts, and I'm going to do that, basically. Um, One idea is that I re-record some old episodes, but in front of an audience, sort of recycle some of the older content, and actually do it again, but in front of an audience especially episodes which are essentially stories, like entertaining stories. For example, I would love to do the Sick in Japan story. I don't know if you've heard that. Is it episode 118? I I mention it every now and again. again. It's the story of how I ended up um, sick in in a hospital in Japan. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, I was really, really unwell and... I was terrified and completely frightened, right? I was complete. I was terrified out of my mind. I thought that I might, I don't know. I thought I might, I was going to die or something. I had no idea what was going on. Um, a horrible nightmare, basically, but real. Uh, so that is a story I've told on the podcast. Uh, I, I told that story 10 years ago. Can you believe it? 10 years ago. And it actually happened to me 20 years ago. I can't believe 20 years have gone by. It's just ridiculous uh, to imagine that. But anyway, that's a story I would like to do in front of an audience and record it for the podcast because I think it's long enough. It's got some, it's got enough funny moments and drama in it. And it's been a long time since I published the episode. And if I did it in front of a live audience, there would probably be differences. It would probably come out a bit different. I would end up riffing on different things. You know, it would it would end up being different to episode 118 or whichever episode it is. Uh, so that's one that I might do. I might do. So look out for more stuff like this in the future, and maybe a live version of Sick in Japan or something like that. We will see. And if you're in Paris, right? If you're in the Paris area. Then, well, um, what should I say? That just, you know, pay attention because I might mention that I'm doing a talk and then you will be able to sign up and come. It's free. Uh, 
Uh, but you need to just sign your name. You know, you need to sign up online just so we know how many people are coming. So we've got the right number of chairs and stuff. So, yeah, pay attention. Listen out for uh, any announcements of uh, teacher talks. Uh, talks in English, that's what they call at the British Council from me in the nearest future. In fact, I've, I was talking to Phil, the marketing manager. We sort of penciled in. What day was it? The 19th of May actually, for Sick in Japan, live at the British Council. We've penciled that in. Um, if you're a listener to a phrasal verb a day, you'll know what to pencil something in means. It's when you kind of like put something in the diary, but it's not permanently put in. It's penciled in. It's written with pencil. So if you change the plan, you can easily rub it out and put the date in another place. So you kind of like make a tentative preliminary plan to pencil something in. So actually we have penciled it in 19th of May for the Sick in Japan story live in the Turner Room at the British Council um, 2022. So if you're in the Paris area and you're interested in that, then um, yeah, have a look at the British Council's website, britishcouncil.fr and um, you should see a section called Events. And in that section, that's where you would find the page for that talk when it's when it's uploaded. Uh, and then you'll be able to book your seat. Um, so anyway, let me know how it was listening to this as a podcast episode. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. If you got this far, right, and if you managed to get this far, if you survived and you're not just a skeleton with headphones on, or you're not just fast asleep somewhere. If you got this far and you're still conscious, then, you know, find a way to tell me. Let's think of a code word that you could use to show that you've listened until the very end. Let's say that if you got this far, then you have to use the word love in your comment. All right. It's appropriate considering the topic of the episode. If you got this far, you have to use the word love in your comment, especially if you use it in a Beatles lyric such as love is all you need or all you need is love or the love you take is equal to the love you make or in, or in fact any beetle lyric in the comments to show that you've listened all the way until the end and if you mention the word love you get bonus points if you're the word, if if the lyric is part of the message that you're writing in the comments section you get bonus points and especially if you mention that a semolina pilchard was climbing up the eiffel tower during this episode then you will get bonus points and more than just 10 points okay right so uh, thank you for listening more podcast episodes will be coming towards your ears soon just a reminder that if you're looking for private one-to-one -one lessons online with a teacher, check out British Council English Score Tutors, uh, teacherluke.co.uk slash English. At least 150 BC approved teachers to choose from, classes adapted to your needs, your English needs anyway. Uh, all from the comfort of your own home. Uh, $1 for the first lesson so you can just check it out. You can like dip a toe in the water. Uh, and then if you pay for a pack of lessons, you'll get one lesson free because you're a Lepster. Uh, for the details and to get the offer, teacherluke.co.uk slash English. And there is a link in the episode description. All right. Nice one. So thank you for listening. I hope you loved this episode. By the way, my pod room <laughs> is nearly ready. It still isn't ready. Can you believe it? Is nearly ready, for goodness sake. Um, there's still no electricity connection or internet connection. I know, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. A guy came last week to fit plugs around the room, like plug sockets, which obviously are important, so I can plug stuff in. Um, so a guy came to fit plugs around the room and to connect the room to the earth. Now, if you know anything about electric stuff then your electrical connections all have to be earthed so that the electricity has somewhere to go if the you know so basically so that the electricity goes pew, down into the earth and it doesn't go through you and kill you because that would be bad wouldn't it imagine if i waited like 3 months to get my pod room set up and finally i i'm ready okay i'm ready to start 
recording. I plug in my microphone, touch the microphone, and zzz, ah, dead. That's it. The end of Luke's English podcast. That would be a pity. So yeah, he came to fit the plugs to uh, earth the room, and um, he just he didn't finish. Right, he just needs to come back to do a little bit of paperwork. You know, it's just one of those things where he's like, uh, bah, monsieur, uh, you know, I have to go now because it's five o'clock. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've got a couple of other things to do, but I'll, I'll come back probably Monday. Of course, I texted him saying, oh, let me know when you can come. Oh, it, it's not going to be Monday, actually. I'll let you know. I was like, OK, well, I'm available on Tuesday. He said, well, to be honest, it's not up to me when I come. It depends on the electricity company. I was, so I was like, great. Is this ever going to happen? Um, and then he texted me today saying, well, actually, um, it, it looks like Friday afternoon. It's like Friday afternoon. That's a, that's a whole week after you were supposed to complete the work. I mean, I'm being nice to him. I'm like, oh, okay, I you know, maybe I shouldn't be nice. Maybe I'm too nice. That's the thing. I don't know. Um, I, th- I don't know. I don't think it makes any difference, to be honest. But he just needs to come back and do a bit of paperwork. And then the electricity will be connected. Someone in a room somewhere needs to flick a switch. But that will involve emails and paperwork and da 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 And then the f- switch will be flicked and then ding, into, um, electricity in my room. And then, of course, I need another another guy, another hardworking, motivated person to come and connect the room to the fiber optic internet. He's, he or she, probably he, will come and have to connect the fiber optic cable into the room, drill a little hole in the wall, and, there, you know, the cable will come in, he'll glue it down the wall, fit a little box, and then from that box I connect my internet uh, wireless internet box which will provide my room with wi-fi and then hallelujah i'll actually be able to start working properly again and i can't wait i'm buying a second-hand desk i know that you really want to know this this is why i'm telling you i'm buying a second-hand desk from a local company tomorrow i've been looking online at you know used desks i don't need to buy a new one i can't really afford to buy a new one because they can be very expensive so i'm buying a second hand one from a company i'm, a, I'm going to go and pick it up tomorrow i'm going to have to carry it uh, to my office luckily it's only around the corner i'm going there tomorrow it was of course it was supposed to be today i was supposed to pick it up this afternoon but the girl I was buying it from, she sent me a message at the last minute. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to cancel. I'm going to have to postpone. <laughs> like, what? Why does everything take so bloody long? I don't know. I'm looking for. I'm. I'm also looking for a decent office chair at a good price. I'm not asking if you're selling one. I'm just saying it. So I don't even have a chair yet. But you know, I will podcast standing up if I have to. All right. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time. Anyway, there you go, a little update on the pod room. It's slowly coming together as the as the glacier you know, as the polar ice cap melts, as glaci- glaciers have moved more rapidly than the work on my pod room. You know, by the time I finally get set up, continent the continents will have shifted, you know. <laughs> the earth will look completely different to how it did. Uh, at the beginning of this process but finally i will have my own podcast room and it's going to be good okay all right then there you go thanks for listening leave your comments with a beat or lyric or the word love or something like that so i know that you're an extra special listener and you listened all the way to the end speak to you soon i think that's probably a good time to stop so i will now say to you all out there in podcast land uh goodbye bye 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.